tell you again, the, the Ugly Club will be celebrating its 150th anniversary, and I'm planning on going, and a lot of students of Fenno Heaths and colleagues from, from past generations, many generations of Yaleys will be there, and since you're not going to be coming to New Haven unless you'd like to sing with everybody, um, this is an opportunity for my friends there and all these other classmates to hear a story about Fenno Heath that is uh, from a very different perspective than just about anybody else who might be in New Haven. Well, I didn't know him personally, really, because the teacher very rarely knows anyone in particular, and uh, unless you've had him for many years, many years, that sort of thing. But, but this was a matter of a semester or two, and he was one of the very first to experience what is called total immersion in language, which my very wonderful French professor, Jean Borges, had uh, devised at that point, a um, matter of not teaching grammar as a dry thing and vocabulary by this by the dozen well they would have to head vocabulary lessons yes we didn't teach that we just from the very very beginning talked French to them and that was it and they better swim or drown and nobody drowned not at all among my students was Fenno Heath I do remember him really quite well for the following reason. I had given an assignment, as more or less the first assignment, that they should write something in French, anything that they wanted, and uh, it didn't need to be long, it could, whatever they wanted. So among all the students, I called one, I called another, and then I called Fenno Heath, and lo and behold, there were two students that came up. And they stood next to where I sat, and one, Fenno Heath, had a fruit, the other had a paper which he was going to read. And lo and behold, started the fruit with some lovely two, probably medieval-like, and the other read what seemed to be a poem. I have no idea what he wrote. It was in some kind of a meter. The pronunciation wasn't too bad, so that I probably understood more or less what he was saying, all accompanied by a lovely sound of a very pure flute. And I think they were trying to get me because I was this young thing, not much older than they, and by gum, they could, they could probably wind me around their little finger very easily. They could, probably. But as so happened, it so happened that I, myself, was then still am a passionate musician. And so I absolutely gobbled this up and found it wonderful and applauded and said bravo and they didn't know what to do with that and that's the end of that particular story. What did he appear like and what did the students, the students were they uh, wearing coats and ties? Did he wear a coat and tie? Um, no, I don't think coats and ties that much but sweaters and uh, not blue jeans and not torn shirts and stuff like that. No, they, they were decently attired. But, uh, no, informal, mm -hmm. but, but clean cut. Clean and cut. And Fenno was clean cut. He was very gentle. 
looking and really quite handsome. Um, it's too long ago. I probably would recognize this picture if you were to show it. As I would the other student whose name I cannot recall. And they both turned out to be really top students. Actually, I don't recall. There was one student who was in the Navy, and somehow he wasn't quite as good as the rest of them, and he was older than they. Mm. What but year would this have been? This, I suspect, was 1944. 1944. Unless it was second semester 1943. No, I doubt it. No, I graduated in '43 from college. I see. In your position at Yale, you were with the Department of... Of Romance Languages. Romance Languages. And that was my major. I was working for my master's at the time. Mm -hmm. So... Hmm. And uh, when I mentioned to you that among Fenno's teachers at Yale later in the music school was Paul Hindemith, you yes. had something to say about that. Oh as yes, well. one of my my co-student was the wife of Paul Hindemith. Her name was Gertrude, and she was particularly interested in the in the Canadian philosopher Maritain. And she studied not with Jean Bosch, who was more into uh, the history of the French language, but with Henri Père, who was, of course, a very, very well-known uh, literature, and, yeah, he was a wonderful professor. That's right. So, Do you have a recollection of who they met personally? Very much so. We had a chance to go and uh, have tea at his house, and she was not very tall, very jolly, and a little bit rotund. And uh, it, the house was full of, uh, what do you call that, uh, wood that comes out of the water. I don't know why I remember. Don't you remember Driftwood. That? Driftwood, thank you. It was full of driftwood, and he liked to sketch, actually. Music and sketching go together very nicely, whereas sketching and music don't necessarily, just as mathematics and music going, go together very nicely. But mm -hmm. many musicians, for, for lack of knowing mathematics, stayed poor. So uh, he, he just was very, very nice. I still have a Christmas card from him, signed by Hindemith, wishing me Happy Christmas. And the tree consisted of nothing but notes, 16 snow notes, 32nd notes, half notes, all notes, quarter notes. Very, very, very nice. I also recall one concert that he gave, and that was medieval, medieval music played on the original instruments that had been borrowed from the Metropolitan Museum. And they started playing the most gosh awful mooing and squealing and squawking came out of it. The only thing that was halfway pure was the drum. And they came to one spot, I think Hindemith was playing something like a recorder. And after a while he couldn't stand it anymore. He just burst out laughing. And he couldn't blow for laughing. So that was... <laughs> From the sound of these instruments. Right. That's right. You also mentioned that you were aware of Marshall Bartholomew. Oh, yes. I sang in his chorus. You sang in his chorus. You were in graduate school. I was in graduate school. And also singing in a chorus. Exactly. Oh, yes. What was that like? Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, the, um, actually, 
he was instrumental in trying and getting me as a voice teacher, which that did, no, wait a minute, he taught me himself. What he did, he sent me to some kind of a, uh, somebody to give me physical exercises. I did that for a while, but it was not very long before I was graduating, uh, getting my master's, so it, it was not very long, but I, I did sing under Bartholomew. Mm, in a chorus, it was, it was a mixed long. chorus of graduate students and music uh, students? Mostly, well, they were Yale students, Yale students, and of course the bass and tenor were all students. I don't know where all the, I think faculty wives and things like that, in addition to graduate students, of which there were a fair, a fair number. But I think that was the first year that they admitted any kind of women, graduate student, graduate student only. Graduate student only. So you were, you were a pioneer as a graduate student also, because right. that was a new innovation. Because of the war. Because of the war, I see. Well, where, where, where did these women graduate students live uh, on campus? Well, I got to live at St. Elmo's, which had been turned over to two women. That was very nice. I also wanted to say that we had the first contingent of uh, military going over to France and they suffered through this total immersion. And I think they all spoke pretty decent French by the time we got through with them. So, and now, now that's a method you put on. You put on your, your tape or whatever, where, the, where somebody speaks French at you. But that's a different situation where there's no one to listen to you and to get you on the right path. So anyway, it's, it was an incredible and very wonderful experience for me. To be at Yale then. To be at Yale. And it was fun to know that one of your students, um, yes, that one of your students was Penno Heath, who was a very graceful, I remember him as a very graceful, gentle, and bright person, very bright. In a college where there was still music, and music really seems to have been suffusing the college experience, even though people were preparing for war. There was chorale, oh, yes. there was... Oh, yes. That's, that's part of keeping the, the spirit going. And of course, for me, music has been my life. Thank you, Aunt Annabeth, very much. Yeah. This is fun. Annabeth Pearls in Pacific Palisades telling us about Yale in the 1940s. And these are wonderful stories. Will you let me come back again and perhaps we can learn even more? This is your home. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.